Okay, so it's nice to see your uh, bearded vis vis visage. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sir. Uh, so, um, as usual, I've been uh, happily, uh, you know, perusing your posts on Facebook, which is how I met you, and uh, the uh, the glory of Samar Al Sayari continues. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I'm just a student that is trying to explore what is beyond our knowledge. Yeah. So, what I wanted to do, what this, what this particular podcast is going to be called, is. Uh, an introduction to the architecture beyond space time. So, with uh, with that um, kind of science fiction like title, um, excuse me, uh, you know, what we could you, one could start talking about, um, you know, architects on acid, <laughs> and uh, and really dismiss the whole thing. But in reality. Um, I think that, uh, and I think you and I have agreed on so many so many things that we talk about. Um, I think architecture, I was certainly taught in school that architecture, uh, the evolution of architecture reflects the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times. And um, in general, I think that you can align uh, the history of architecture directly with innovations, not only in technology, but in the continuing evolution of, of philosophy. And um, part of what we might talk today, too, of course, is that I do think that there that I think I may have said this to you in one of our prior conversations or over the phone that it's not like I believe that um, the human spirit has evolved. I think that um, you could easily argue that we're less intelligent than Plato and Aristotle in the early you know, but even, you know, back further in time and that perhaps that consciousness hasn't evolved. Technology has certainly evolved. And, and this, whether it means that we're, we're significantly out of balance or whether we've always been out of, out of balance. I know one of the other things that you talked about that, that you and I have talked about that I struggle with is our universe was born through immense violence this huge explosion um and they and part of what we what you and I'll probably talk about today is that when i say an architecture beyond space time it's the it's the philosophy and the physics that seem to be pointing to a possibility that space time itself is a projection and and it's it's all these philosophies that are associated with uh the fact that we may be a virtual reality and and that um, at the core of our reality, and these are things I've I've personally only really come to understand, theorize theorize about, and then I was introduced to um, at the core of our reality are photons, are quarks, are things that actually have no mass, <laughs> and and it's almost like when you look to the nth degree, you realize that we are we're, we actually our illusion we're 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 basically you know densified forms of light so in my recent discussion with the uh cog cognitive behavioral scientist and philosopher of science donald hoffman um we 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 talked about um the the great tragedy that architecture uh can be can be uh, described as in the sense of, you know, the tragic profession of architecture in that we are a profession that is using uh, materialism to the nth degree. You know, we, we, we design immensely heavy structures that displace the earth. And that would seem to be the exact opposite of the idea that that our only reality is consciousness and that there is no materialism. So it's a beautifully contradictory profession. And I think if 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 uh, if we are to take on some of the current theories of physics, that we are living, that the only reality is consciousness and that as architects, we are manipulating light. We're manipulating massless things. 
it's it's kind of a, a mind blowing and an inherent contradiction with with perhaps even the way we were educated that that architecture is all about the one brick on top of another and it's the most massive the most material the disciplines so that's how i'd start our discussion well this is a very interesting actually you know something david um, our traditional education our perception since the beginning of time as architects mm -hmm. and as builders we we usually used uh, space and mass that was our tools that was our uh, medium that we design in but never never that we took attention to time and uh, you know the, the the most constant thing in our life and the most constant changing thing in life is time so this is really interesting why didn't architects actually use time also as a medium in design not only space we 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 all the time talk about space and the special definition strategies and how space could define our um, uh, daily activities, how the space could be the container of our social lives. But why we didn't also design space time or just focus a little bit on time? You know, we as human beings, we are moving objects. The, the usual um, speed of a regular man or a human being is 1.3 to 1.4 meter per second. And in the emergency cases, it's like 2.1 meter per second. Why didn't we really take this into consideration? Knowing that which either, with each step, our perception totally changes. Our conscious in the space almost also changes. You know, I have prepared some slides trying to visualize or depict those kind of stuff, if I may. Uh, yeah, and um, Samer, the lower, from my screen, the lower part of your face is being uh, is cut off. So yeah. it, let me adjust this a little bit. Yeah, I think that I think that's better. I think it's better, but you, you're still it's still you have to lean back a little yeah. if you want people to see your lovely yeah. face. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to share a screen now. Okay. Yeah. Uh oh, actually, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I have to uh, multiple participants. Okay, now you can you should be able to share a screen. Okay, let me see it. Well, um, first of all, disclaimer that uh, my presentation would be a little bit uh, sound uh, crazy, I might say, or uh, uh, out of this uh, logic. But let's just agree to accept whatever radical ideas that I'm going to um, share today. It, it could be the reality, but uh, we just simply don't know more about it. So anyway. I called the presentation tonight, I was a little bit ambiguous. Would it be better to say AI exploration or quantum science exploration or conscious exploration? I, I really didn't reach the title of the presentation. But what is interesting is I try to explore different scenarios dealing with the same context that you have introduced today. What if we are succeeded as designers and architects in trespassing the dimensionality of our perception? Second is retro causality, and uh, we will talk about it a little bit, um, moving to the parallel worlds, moving to the special temporal model, and then finally establishing a connection with other species. Um, so let's dig in. So I'll, I'll start with the retro causality. By the way, all of the previous concepts are connected to each other. They are not um, projected uh, in parallel, but uh, they are all the same at the same time. So let's begin with the retro causality. For those who didn't, don't really know about retro causality, it's called backward causation. It's a concept of cause, effect, cause and effect in which effect precedes its cause. And it's a little bit weird, but it was proven, proven experimentally and theoretically in, in several quantum experiments. So anyway, what if the effect precedes its cause in time? And so later- Well, well look, you wanna talk about this just a little, you allow me to interject? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So yeah. the way the way you and I, um, talked about retro causality in our in our last uh, phone conversation and again for the purposes of this uh, podcast um where uh Sam and I together are potentially introducing quote unquote a new architecture um let's one of the fascinating things uh I was listening to a lecture by the uh Nobel uh, laureate uh, Roger Penrose about um the idea that uh in terms of the local and the non-local that um when 
we are uh, perceiving someone else. When I am looking at Samer, when I am holding a glass in my hand, when I'm when I'm uh, literally taking in my reality, whether it's at the micro scale, the macro scale, in any way that I am cognizant of our reality, um, we are um, in effect capturing a moment of the infinite. And and this is me. Uh, classic architect mis misstating, <laughs> not I don't think misreading, but putting Penrose's uh, uh, great theoretical strides in in a uh, in architectural terms. So what we're doing is, for argument's sake, we live in a kind of permanent non-locality, which is the infinite. We live in this infinite place. When we perceive something, we are collapsing the infinite wave function into something that we recognize, an object. And that, in order to do that, we're actually going back in time. That's the linkage to this concept of retrocausality, where we are actually traveling backwards in time because time is accelerating permanently. And in order to capture anything, you have to almost time travel backwards. Now, they believe it's like microseconds, but it, but it's, that's the effect. You're traveling backwards in time. So I, I just wanted to put that in there. Yeah, that illustrated a lot of uh, my explanation. So I, I have to thank you for this um, description. So let's begin with the first project, which I called Tesseract Butterfly Project. And it is a compound kind of project. You know, there is Tesseract. Tesseract is a four-dimensional cube. We have the square, which is a two-dimensional entity, and then the cube which is a three-dimensional entity. And here stops our perception as architects with the mess, the cube, the new cubism. We usually talked about the cube as a space and as a mess. But why didn't we realize that it is a four-dimensional object and maybe more, maybe fifth-dimensional object, maybe sixth-dimensional. But I'm tackling here the fourth-dimensional object. And then we have the butterfly effect. The butterfly effect, and I'm a little bit, uh, misspelled the, the word. It's a I like butterfly. Thing. Butterfly seems fine. <laughs> well, anyway, the, the butterfly, small um, small uh, action, which might result in drastic or dramatic uh, effects. So what if we combine both of them? Which means that the, the butterfly project or the butterfly effect is an ever-changing and everlasting project. It's not a static result. It's not a fixed result. It's changing by time. As the origins of the of the of the event changes, the result also changes. So it's it's a time thing. So um, I started by creating the four-dimensional butterfly, literally a butterfly capturing the motion, ca capturing all of its um, past, present, and future moments in just one frozen mess. So from here I have started, and then I started exploring different concepts and ideas. What if I have the, the the Tesseract butterfly project was projected into the Hassmann style of Paris. And would it be would it would it fit into some kind of of um, of a moment in the history? And I found that yes, might be the Art Nouveau. It might be um something like Antonio Gaudio, I might say. But anyway, it might fit. So what if that was another reality in another dimension, but at the same space and the same time that we are occupying. And from here, I started exploring different possibilities. And it goes on until I started my Tesseract Butterfly Resort as well. Something that um, in traditional uh, design uh, school of architecture, they might say that it is as a form of biomorphism or, or even biomimicry. But from, from where I stand, I can see that this is exceeds our understanding of biomimicry and biomorphism. It is simply a tesseract, and it is a butterfly. The effect of our of the butterfly in our perception, which resulted in 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 having most of the divine roots, which were, could be reflected into design principles or design codes, and that is the whole process, starting by the chronophotography, trying to mimic the chronophotography of Etienne Moray and Mybridge in 1907, and then starting from here until I have reached the end result. So that is the whole exploration of it. Moving to literal uh, interpretation of the retrocausality, a change and the cause and effect, but um, in a backward uh, 
um, session. So this is parts of old Cairo, you know, in the Middle East. This is the mid-age Cairo. It's called the Mamluk. Of course, all of these pictures are just AI um, generated images. None of them are real, but they are very, very near to old Cairo, which does exist today. So this is something that we have been witnessing since the last 600 years, maybe. But what if the course of history is just changed and we didn't have the, the French invasion and the English-British invasion and things uh, changed drastically and the architectural style changed? What if the same style just developed by time responding to the technology in the building materials and using the AI, I have started understanding that the, the essence of the past or um, the spirit of the past might still exist. The mixed use kind of architecture where on the first ground floor you can find retails and on the upper floors it is still the residential just as 600 years ago people used to design. It is a faceted design using even calligraphy or arabesque but using contemporary material that didn't exist at that time. So this is the natural uh, course of history that would exist if <clears throat> things a little bit changed. And I do believe in, in somewhere and in some time, maybe uh, occupying our same uh, space time, this reality does exist. Moving to the old Egyptians, what if the old Egyptians continued in their course of history and they didn't end by another uh, civilization or another culture and they succeeded in amazing us with their inventions and using their um, unknown weird technology in building massive structures of today. And also that was uh, another exploration using the artificial intelligence. And I use the artificial intelligence, by the way, I do believe that using the artificial intelligence, it's not just a tool of drawing or depiction, depiction of um, uh, notions. No, I do think that it is portal to the future. I do think that using AI, uh, we are just drawing a blueprint for the future. And that might exist in the future or that might be a portal to another dimension that does exist at our same time, but in another space. So anyway, and then developing into a spaceport where you can just connect to other species, other intelligent life forms using the same architecture or maybe taught by those intelligent life forms to build here on Earth. And moving and moving and starting to um, design all kind of ty architectural typologies and moving from the old Egyptians or the ancient Egyptians, which is, of course, the, the science, um, the future of Egyptians, not the old Egyptians, I might say, to the Greek, which might use also another form of materials. And by the way, this was not glass. It looks like glass or plexiglass even or acrylic, but this is something that we do have today called aluminum, aluminum oxynite tried. It's a transparent metal, transparent aluminum that can resist and can bear loads. And, uh, and um, you can use it not just as a skin, but also structurally in our structure. So what if the old ancient Greeks used that as part of their architectural marvels, not just only stone? And imagining the Acropolis, but con the, continua the continuation of the time of the past till to the present and then to the future <clears throat> with the Acropolis, and moving from the Greek, the course of history, <clears throat> and having the Colosseum, the Roman. And um, you might find here that uh, I have numbered the pictures. This is what we have in our reality. But uh, in some realities and other realities and other dimension, there might be something hybrid with today's technology, but with a past uh, architectural style. But also in another dimensionality, there is a different interpretation of the Colosseum, these shiny uh, metal cubes floating without any structural support, just using the levitated gravity concept. So these are three different depictions from three different dreams. And it might exist at the same time, but we realize only number one. We didn't realize or perceive with our uh, minds, number two or number three, but they might exist at the same time and uh, they might reveal themselves maybe in the future or something. Moving to La Sagrada Familia, and this is the most interesting project that I personally really loved. This is, of course, not the current La Sagrada Familia. The, the lower part is all intervention by another culture and trying to understand what if 
it continued the building. I know that it, it will finish uh, soon, but what if we continued building and uh, developing the Sagrada Familia for the next 300 years? What kind of technology, what kind of building material and building morphologies would be projected on, on, the, on the building? And from the Sagrada Familia to Notre Dame de Paris or Notre Dame uh, Gothic churches and trying to understand the quality of the space and time, which might be something like the Agora, so mixing typologies from different civilizations, the, something like a public space where people can interact and um, can uh, enjoy. And the most interesting part is, what if La Sagrada Familia was built in Cairo 600 years ago during the Islamic era? This is a church, this is not a mosque, but it is built in a different context. And by the word context, it's a very interesting notion, actually. We as architects, uh, usually use the context to refer to different site or specific site. But from where I see it, the, the context might be the cultural context. It might be the social context. It might be the technological uh, context. So this um, is La Sagrada Familia in yeah. Cairo 600 years ago. I'm looking, I'm looking for a time to actually interject, but I, I'm remember, I'm remembering in my, in my talks with you that you're, that you're, uh, your mind works so so fast that you usually get into these riffs. Um, so, do you mind if I interject a little bit? Yeah, sure, please. Yeah. So, what? So, one of the things that we could argue by the you know the wonderful AI work that that you're doing is you know everything when when I say an architecture beyond space time, um, that's um a huge huge subject infinite subject and and um what it what it is at least arguing is a kind of multi-dimensional um view of our reality um and perhaps a view of our reality almost outside of our reality and and artificial intelligence is going to help accelerate massively accelerate how we how we look into other cultures how we blend other cultures how we blend other architectures um and um uh as we muse on this i think i think we are at a uh, a very critical moment in uh in world in world history in cultural history um uh primarily um because of the level of technological development that um is um accelerating almost vertically and i do think architecture um if it wants to to kind of uh match again the zeitgeist the spirit of our time um one of the ways that we are imagining this whether it be a multiverse whether you know a, a, a many worlds hypothesis um or or whatever other version of, of, as I was saying, capturing our time as you've talked about retro causality, we're starting to see how you, Samer al Sayari are experimenting in this using um, AI. And um, I think that there are urbanistic implications, there are, there are uh, specific architectural implications, but we do have an opportunity to, to go back in time, to blend, how how different uh, architectural approaches have worked to to uh, uh, to even counteract um, the the weight of buildings and and examine things floating in the air or what have you. So if I might add just a small statement, yeah. it might reset our understanding to the theory and history that we were taught in in architectural schools. Mm -hmm. So it is it is something uh, we we might write new theories. We might even write new history based mm -hmm. on this kind of depictions right so this is another context which is la sagrada familia in tehran this is this might be the impossible scenario that we didn't really see in our time but um, nonetheless it might exist I, i'm not saying that it might have existed if the history changes but it might be really existing in, in another realm so la sagrada familia from cairo which is the city of stone to Tehran in Iran and then in the industrial age and maybe in the uh, steampunk style, something from the movie industry. Mr. Tim Burton would be happy to see La Sagrada Familia. 
uh, after having this um, using the scrap method, metal scraps, but it might exist. So fraternities, we as architects usually design spaces, design messes, but why don't we just start by designing social context? I designed a project called fraternity. What is fraternity? What kind of architecture that might be the social container of a fraternity? And I started by quarries, the pure form of a stone connecting to earth, connecting naturally to our earth. We usually carve stone and we cut stone and start um, uh, sculpting in stone to use it as a building material. But what if we use the stone as it is in nature as a space? These are maybe a contemporary depictions of quarries or quarries converted into architectural space and moving also to the interior quality of quarries inside it. This is, um, this is not just a space, this is not just art, it is an emotional status. It is a feeling, it is how you feel toward the space, how you feel toward the earth architecture. And moving to paradise bird, how would be the paradise bird legacy or culture if, if we just projected this concept not just as an inspiration but as a culture what if the paradise world where paradise bird was in some kind of a nation uh, complete culture what how would it look like and even blending the paradise bird with art nouveau in in paris or in europe and moving to the concept of the metamorphic it is something also that is space time model something that changes by, by time. And uh, many architects actually tackled the metamorphoses. But what if we just reinterpreted or redesigned the concept using the space-time method, something that has been built for like 100 years, something that is formed by nature and from nature with nature. The nature here is the architect, not a human architect. So <clears throat> having many depictions um, from several contexts, from Finland and Helsinki to maybe uh, Berlin to Middle East, trying to understand how the metamorphic concept might look like. And here, there is a very interesting um, uh, story of Borano Island. Borano Island is real, by the way, it is in Italy. Borano Island is a fisherman island where uh, fishermen, uh, while they are fishing in, in sea, they try to define their houses and they decided that each one of them would color his own house with a distinctive color so it is a very vivid colorful village but what if the burano island was a global thing was a global legacy how it would look like and i started depicting those images in different and bigger contexts in in sustainable kind of architecture in bigger housing complexes where you can identify your um, your floor and your apartment and what if it is a little bit uh, transparent in another different context that would like to capture the sunlight, but here you will capture the sunlight and create a different quality of interior that is colorful and at the same time reflects the culture of Burano Island. So notions of play, and this is one of the, um, the direct interpretation of this kind of uh, ideology, I might say, and this is an awarded project, by the way. I just received the award uh, 48 hours from, from now. So that is the notions of play. What is play? Is the play intellectual thing or is it a physical thing? Is it an exploratory thing or it uh, needs more effort from your mind? It's something like chess, maybe, or something like soccer or football. So this is a kind of architecture that might absorb and contain and reflect the notions of play. And starting from this concept, I try to simplify and conduct classical studies on this kind of architecture. So these images are not uh, AI, those are my design, depending on the previous set, uh, image. And uh, starting from here and reaching to the playhouse. And it was awarded the, just a couple of months ago from South Korea and Seoul. This is my 44th award and I'm proud of it. So that is the metaverse house. It's a metaverse project. So the concept even of the metaverse converges a lot 
with what we are saying. In the metaverse, you can control time, you can control gravity, you can control the realm and define its parameters as you wish. In, in metaverse, new theories will, will occur. No need for a bathroom, no need for a kitchen, but there is a need for more social spaces. There is a need to blend in in something that might elevate your um, mental state and psychological state. Feel happy inside the playhouse. Feel ex the feel ex exploration. Uh, maybe exert a little bit of a physical effort. So all of those notions were generated originally using AI and then turned into architectural manifestation. Dealing what is future cities? And here, when I talk about future. Actually, I do believe that time is a big illusion, but time is the only entity that may prevent everything that is happening at the same time to be frozen at what moment. So future cities, is it dystopian or a utopian? It might be, I'm a little bit pessimistic maybe due to the global challenges that we are facing today, but what if that is our reality in just a couple of years from now and we enjoy it? We don't see it as dystopian. As this image might, might imply that this is a very miserable kind of life, but you can also find that it is intimate, it is cozy. There is life. Yeah, might be broken uh, walls, but there is life. And trying to explore more and more of this kind of lifestyle and how people might enjoy their uh, existing in um, dystopian architecture, and maybe we say today, or we call it today slums, or we might call it today informal housing, but that might be something um, that is real just a couple of years ago from now. So what if the industrial age and Renaissance merge together in another realm? How it would look like? How it would look like the, the principles of Renaissance architecture and the industrial steam engine just being used together? Another depiction. The famous quote of Le Corbusier, the house is a machine to live in. What if in another realm it was literally interpreted and there were real machines that people live inside? How the modernism, the simple glass structures and the machines would coexist together in one space time that is a residential and producing oxygen, producing um, food, producing even your happiness, producing your emotions, producing your memories, that might be a literal depiction of it. What is the concept of the petrification? Would it be a city? How a city would be petrified? Petrified means that it's something that does, did exist thousands of years ago and was abandoned by its residents. But what if the cities was petrified and still used to them? How it would look like? WCs, public WCs, I don't know how you, go, you call it in the United States, WCs like um, public bathroom, pub, public uh, toilets, I don't know, public restrooms, maybe. So when we say restroom or public WC, it always pop in my mind a place that is um, dirty, smelly, whatever. But what if the WC was just a space for you to take care of yourself? How it would look like in another realm? What if we just extracted out of its context that we know today and try to understand that there might be new uh, contexts out of it. So these are depictions of a luxurious WCs, public WCs, a place where you can enjoy going to and urban cities of Middle East. The cities of Middle East might be congested. Um, it might look a little bit random or with some certain level of chaos, but what if those urban spaces was redefined? And uh, here the interesting thing is, this kind of architecture that we have resulted today, it might be informal planning, it might be um, the design of non-professional architects and planners, but what if instead of the gentrification process that we know today, we just altered the past of those guys? We're not trying to replace those guys with another kind of uh, form of urban uh, gentrification, but we succeeded in redesigning their past and then we see their future. So starting from this past and with the concept of gentrification as we know today, which is a process 
the character of a poor urban area is changed by wealthier people. We will just remove the wealthier people and we will replace it with wealthier past, educating those guys in the same space and time. This is what we see in our current situation. And moving from this one, changing the past, that might be the same place, the same mass, the same urban spaces, but with a different kind of architecture, with a different kind of culture, with a different kind of past. So moving from this past to this future, from this past, re-altering the past of these people and with the manipulation in time, we might find at the same time today, those same spaces change it into those spaces. From this reality to this reality, the same space, but different reality, different course of time. So moving to another life form, which is the swarm. The swarm intelligence is defined as the intelligence of um, pack of uh, creatures floating together. It might be a pack of birds or uh, um, fish, maybe. They act differently. They have a different intelligence. So those are phenomena from the nature, whatever it's fish or birds or whatever. What if we succeeded in freezing the motion pass of the swarm intelligence and trying to make architecture that reflects the intelligence of the swarm, which, by the way, is reduced into three main principles. I don't have the luxury of time, of course, of talking much more about the swarm intelligence, but what kind of architecture that might reflect the swarm? This is what I, I do believe in, using, of course, uh, the aid of AI. What if we succeeded in encasing nature or in boxing nature, petrified kind of nature? So we are having trees inside the glass box, and this is our future house. This is the house that we are will be living in, something that um, follow the rules of the urban design of our planning modern cities, but at the same time, it is nature. I mean, the Japanese succeeded in making box watermelons, so why not we cannot make nature in boxes? Dream. What is a dream? I do believe also dream is just another portal to another reality. The dream is not illusion. It might be a reality, but in another dimension that we didn't physically succeed in, in uh, going to. But we... Samer, I'll, I'll interject here as we get into dreams yeah. briefly. Um, so the, you know, one way of, of viewing the future of architecture um and in in response and in reflecting on some of the some of the imagery that you've presented, um, theoretically you'd have um, architecture firms become more and more laboratory like, where entire ecosystems, entire realities, are being uh, experimented with, and and even adding time and history to specific lab models, meaning virtual reality models where you, we could we could see what a certain area would look like if we inject this this social condition there or this social condition there um uh, you know if we experiment with a captured forest in in uh, a cubic form here and then add add 10 years to it there um that that's how i see um codifications and and like methodologies in in the speed in which we can experiment um with a with ai for for argument's sake and the degree to which that is um absorbing what's happening in the sciences and in and in physics i think that there is an equatorial plane now which is the digital equatorial plane and it's really starting to unify all these re all these researches so I think that that's, that's uh, one of the reasons that I wanted to, uh, was excited about you developing some work for this lecture and, and uh, one, of the, one of the fundamental reasons that I wanted to t get on, on Zoom with you in terms of this overriding title, The Architecture Beyond Space Time. Well, you know something? I just um, I totally agree with you with just one difference, very slight difference. When we talk about future architecture, uh, well, actually, I'm not projecting future architecture. I'm altering the past and presenting the present, uh, how what it would uh, look like. So this is present architecture by altering our past. 
Well, it's, it's like different different foliations of our reality. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. exactly. <laughs> right. So how how is dream? So this is a dream. Dream is a blurring uh, the reality. This might look like nature, but if you just focus, there is no one natural element, no trees, no rocks, nothing. Even there is no sky. But you can find that it is an emotion. It is a status that you can feel like you are in nature. But also, it might look like is as, as if it is a built environment. But also, this is not architecture. It is an entity. It is a space. It is uh, a conscious. So we are entering a conscious. We are not entering architecture. This is the dream. The dream. You are. You you always tend to remember the narrative, but you might a little bit forget the details, or the details are a little bit blurry. So I try to depict what is dream. How can we march into dreams? So you will find mm, some entities that look like nature, but they are not nature. Others like spaces, but they are not spaces. But, you know, this kind of images might make you smile, might make you a little bit mm, contemplate maybe. So you, you tend to think, you tend to uh, go with your imagination. So this is the interpretation of a dream. It is a mental state. And returning again to nature. What if we succeeded in uh, decoding nature and understanding the divine rule behind the growth um, of such um, a plant? What is the mathematical formula out of it? We would like to use uh, the help of Mr. Stephen Hawking maybe and uh, or any professional mathematical modeler to write us the formula that we can use in parameter design and start creating architecture inspired by the pine cone. And maybe we could develop the morphology of nature, of course, using the pine cone into architectural form and later developing it into another realities or into another morphologies that might be serving our new context or new needs. So marine life also was another um, subject that I tackled. There is no one single element here that you can define with um, a specific marine life or a specific creature but when you see the composition it looks like it, it is inspired by the marine cultures it is grown from the calcium of the sea but it and, and it looks like it is maybe shells but it is simply called marine uh, architecture different depictions over 600 depiction i just limited the, the pictures for today's uh, time Another depiction of the marine life. It might look like fish, maybe with the scales even, but you can't really um, interpret it directly, but it reflects the culture of the marine notion. But um, taking a specific creature like the Nautilus, this is the real picture of a real Nautilus. How can we use the design principles derived from this morphology and depicted or reflected on a retail facade of a jewelry maker, for example, on some kind of a luxury retail, and taking the design code and trying to reflect it into a physical architectural manifestation. Starting from here and trying to understand it in a third dimensional uh, form, also the Nautilus, the hierarchy, the helix shape, the mathematical proportions, all of those follow the same rules. Also, the marine life or the jellyfish project, which I might, it's a little bit uh, old project, maybe a year or something, but also I try to understand what if we used the, 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 the jellyfish um, to, um, to try to redefine sustainability. I mean, the jellyfish is the only creature that existed maybe 50,000 years ago or maybe more than that, and it still does exist. So that proves that this creature as probably five population. million <laughs> five, oh, okay that that uh, yeah. demonstrates uh, my point of view so yeah. so five million th this is a total sustainability this is something that resists time there is this change it is adaptable it it's um you know the 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 code that goes like this the survival is for the fittest that creature proves it so what if we just use the same concept and try to make something that might survive for maybe 100,000, maybe millions of years. This is one of the most interesting projects of the jellyfish, and it goes like this. Uh, what if Leonardo da Vinci learned 
parametric design and start using the marine life of the jellyfish in parametric design to try to make his first initial prototypes. And that was the depiction from the AI. So it collapsed all the time. It collapsed something from the Renaissance, which is Leonardo da Vinci, was our today's contemporary technology, which are the parametric design, and try to make something also um, inspired or learned from the biomimicry of jellyfish. So they are the combination or the merge of three different entities, Leonardo da Vinci, his Renaissance principles, parametric design, or the generative design, and the jellyfish. And it was amazing. So um, apparently my wife is going to be um, making making noise in the kitchen. That, that's that's totally fine. No worries. <laughs> so we can have, um, we can try um, uh, a part two of this. Okay. Um, but um, I'd also like to conclude, uh, I'll be looking forward to your lecturing uh, the class. Did we set a date for that? Uh, not sure about that. But oh, I'll we'll work on that. I'll work on that with you. But okay. um, you know, for for our students and and for people out outside of our students who who view this, um, this is just a a very very tentative beginning of what I think is an important um, theory of architecture that is um, of our time and that is uh, absolutely reliant and uh, probably exceeding and integrating with artificial intelligence. And uh, Samer has uh, introduced me to the use of artificial intelligence and computers. And I've been doing a lot of experiments my, myself and you're, you, you've you been nothing you but- You look pretty well. Thank yeah, you so the much. And work is incredible. <laughs> And yeah, and I'm so inspired by your work. And um, I, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you in a few weeks or a month or something in my class. And and um, let's let's do a part two. And I, and I think that there are many different ways of setting this into a theory. Um, yeah. But there is it is we are at a very critical moment in world in world history uh, in in all sorts of ways. Some of which are positive, some of which not so positive. Um, and there, it is time for um, really understanding what a new architecture would be. And I think, Samer, you are certainly one of the people that could help guide us there. So um, I'll post this soon. And thank you so much for yeah. speaking today. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll, um, we'll talk soon on Messenger, and I'll set up the next lecture. Sure. Looking but forward to it. Have a wonderful evening, Samer. You too. In Beirut. <laughs> talk to you soon. Please pass my greetings to your wife. I, I'll do that. Thank okay, you. Okay, see you back. Yeah, see you soon, Summer.